It's really my great pleasure to be here to introduce our keynote speaker, um, our opening plenary invasive species and climate change and national perspective. Stash Bergeo will be our speaker and he serves as the executive director of the National Invasive Species Council. In this capacity, he guides implementation of the policy-oriented actions set forth in the annual NISC work plan. Um, they provide advice on invasive species policy development to NISC member departments and agencies and participate in international negotiations focused on invasive species issues. And Stash really has a lot of experience and uh, he's been working on international environmental policy um, with a special interest in invasive species, biodiversity conservation, climate change and trade. Um, he's also worked with a wide range of non-governmental, governmental and intergovernmental organizations such as the Global Invasive Species Program, the Nature Conservancy, uh, UNEP and the World Conservation Monitoring Center and the New Zealand government. He has a PhD in international service from the American University and a B, uh, bachelor's in political science from Swarth Swarthmore College. So with that, um, I won't take any more time and we're really looking forward to hearing from you, Stash. So I'll pass uh, the screen to you now. Thank you, Carrie. And I will pull up my PowerPoint. Can folks see that? Looks great. Yep, and you're all okay. set. Great. Uh, so again, I, first off, I'd like to uh, thank the, the organizers for the Northeast Risk Symposium for in, inviting me. It, it's quite an honor. Um, initially, as I was sort of pulling that information together and thinking about what I was uh, going to talk to, um, you know, one of my, my first reactions or responses in terms of thinking about climate change, just go to, you know, look at some of the resources on the, on the Northeast Risk website, which uh, Tony sort of uh, uh, showcase fairly well, but I realized in this case that might not be the most appropriate. Um, so, uh, but I think that's sort of kudos to the Northeast Risk Network in terms of the, the value of the information that you produced um, and certainly you know, seeing it sort of expand to other regions. Again, I think is a testament to the kind of organization, the focus that you, you've put together here. So, so definite um, acknowledgement to the work of, of the Northeast Risk and the other risks as well. So what I'm gonna to do today is, is really try to um, draw together some reflections that I've had on invasive species and climate change. It's not necessarily NISC policy where I do talk about NISC related documents um, and sort of programs, I will certainly acknowledge that. But again, these are sort of my sort of reflections that I've gathered, gathered over the years looking at, at this issues from, from different perspectives. And really I'm sort of gonna sort of break it into three different sections. Um, the first is just putting us all on sort of the same page in terms of uh, looking at invasive species through the lens of climate change. Then I'll go more specifically into NISC-related work, both, both past and present. And then finally, finish with a couple sort of quick thoughts about regional approaches, given the nature of um, the Northeast risk um, that, as a network. And I also just, again, in sort of looking back through notes and, and work, I came up uh, came upon this, this diagram by Jessica Hellman and others that was done in 2008. And I think it's just a very good visual representation in terms of a lot of the questions that, that we've been talking about that I'll mention today, you know, bringing in pathways and environmental constraints, um, the consequences and the impacts, as well as some of the, the management responses. So a lot of this is building on you know, the, the shoulders of giants and sort of increasing that body of knowledge. And I think there are, you know, there are some seminal articles that, that have been out there along the way that we can sort of continue to learn from. So with that, I'll start in on sort of the, the, the first section. And really, you know, what I'd like to do is just start at base principles with regards to definitions, because I'll coming, be coming back to this a little bit sort of throughout the talk. Um, and starting with the invasive species definition, you're probably well familiar with it, but building on the one that's included in the executive order 13751, which is uh, the one that we work from, really, you know, the, the key, two key elements of, of the invasive species definition is a non-native organism, and that's a non-native to a particular ecosystem. And I think that's you know, particularly um, important wording and that causes or has the potential to cause some sort of damage, whether that's environmental damage, economic damage, 
human health or, or the like. And so really, again, those two key components are, are important when thinking about invasive species. On the climate change side and pulling from the US Global, Ch Global Change Research Program, really when we're, we're talking about climate change, it's, it's focused on kind of the, the, the weather conditions, the temperature, sort of precipitation, um, and the like. And I think a lot of times the, the notion of what climate change is gets um, kind of expanded or, or misrepresented. And I think the US Global Change Research Program also thinks about the issue of global change. So how does the, the changes in climatic factors combined with other things, whether it be uh, wildfire invasive species leads to the changes that we're seeing in our ecosystems and on the ground. And so I think it's useful again to sort of break some of these terms apart um, and to be, you know, to, to help be clear about what we're, we're talking about, particularly as we communicate across communities. And there's a lot more integration now between the invasive species and the climate change community than there was say 10 years ago. But again, you know, different fields of research, different fields of activity, how do we make sure that our, our communications are, are clear and concise? Also, both of the, the areas deal with questions around sort of rates and scales of change. So if we think about some of the, the slides that, that Tony showed in her initial presentation, if we're thinking about um, temperature increase, uh, average precipitation rates, sea level rise, those are often sort of very gradual changes over large scales over, over uh, extended periods of time. But then those can be dotted by kind of short pointed moments um, up on the right side of the screen are, screen are climate related disasters from 2021. So we've got very localized phenomena that are sort of shorter in time or duration and localized in terms of their impact. And so we're looking at this tension between sort of longer term change on a broad scale and short term incidences and impacts. And we also see that with invasive species. Um, so, you know, whether we're looking at um, insect pests, um, if we're looking at invasive uh, fish, aquatic organisms, or even sort of uh, plants and, and other animals on the landscape. Um, each of those sort of has a different sort of time scale in terms of their potential rates of spread. And also thinking about if we're looking at early detection rapid response, what is that window of what is rapid based on a species? And so when we're thinking about issues of, of rates and scales of change, we have to think now both about that from an invasive species perspective, but also how are that the broader changes on the landscape, whether that's sort of longer term temperature increases or sea level rise, as well as those more immediate climate change, the severe weather um, type of events and the like. So I think that that's one of the things that, that we need to be tackling as we, we move forward. And this, you know, again, gets me starting to think about from an institutional perspective, which is, is really sort of my, my focus uh, with regards to the, the work with NISC in terms of how do we match up um, at sort of geographical scales in terms of addressing the problem. Um, climate change and invasive species, they're, they're both national level phenomena, but then when we look at the regional level, there's obviously sort of commonalities across regions, commonalities in terms of species, in terms of biogeographies, and then the local where you know, we're seeing the impacts, where we're seeing a lot of the, the management activities, so how do we bridge these different levels? Um, and really in there, what are the, the different comparative advantages of working at those levels, uh, the institutional actors that are involved, the opportunities, the capabilities and the capacities, as well as the gaps and the needs. Um, and how do we sort of resource those gaps and needs so that we are you know, maximizing both the opportunities as well as the capabilities. As this will be something that I return to um, it, it later in the presentation as well. Now, in terms of you know, what I talked about initially in terms of thinking about the um, looking at invasive species through the lens of climate change, I just want to sort of take you quickly through the invasion curve. And I'm sure you're all sort of well familiar with this in terms of you know, prevention, ideally being sort of the, the least amount of resources invested for the maximal amount of protection up through the, the costs um, of, of long-term management and or containment. Uh, and so in, in looking at this from uh, a climate change lens, first, if we start with, with prevention, there, a lot of what we're talking about, thinking about are the pathways of introduction. And climate change is certainly going to have impacts in terms of the, the, the level of risk um, and, and the potential sort of propagable pressure and the like that, that, 
uh, those particular pathways present on the landscape. So if we just take a couple examples with risks to specific geographies like the Arctic, with, with receding Arctic ice, we're seeing increased transit um, as well as energy development in the Arctic. I put the picture up on the, the upper right hand corner of a, a drilling well. Uh, going back several years, there was an issue with the movement of drilling wells from Singapore up to Alaska and, and Cook Inlet um, with questions raised as to whether they were adequately inspected for any sort of uh, biofouling. And so I think, again, this raises a concern with biofouling as a potential pathway and increased use uh, and transit through, through the Arctic. There's also sort of personal yeah, individual behaviors and patterns. So obviously the movement of recreational boats is, is definitely a, a concern as a pathway for introduction. Um, will changes in, in climate variables um, and, and global change sort of influence boater patterns. If Lake Mead and Lake Powell have excessive drought and their water levels are going down, will that force boaters, boaters to go in, in, in other directions? Additionally, if we have longer boater seasons, what are the demands on resource managers in terms of watercraft inspection and decontamination? So thinking through what are the management implications there? Similarly, with you know, recreational gardening, uh, whether it's water gardens or, or the garden in your backyard with shifting plant zones, um, are there new species that are in, in being introduced to in a region? Um, how do we intersect with the, the horticultural trade in that regard, as well as the aquaculture trade? And then finally, also thinking about what are the steps being taken to potentially mitigate um, some of the, the impacts of climate change or to um, look at sort of greenhouse gas emissions and the like. And are there potential risks embodied in those types of actions that we need to be concerned about? If we go back to 2012 and 13, um, the EPA was looking at uh, renewable, renewable fuel standards for particular uh, species of plants that could be used as biofuels. And in that discussion, uh, napier grass as well as uh, arundodonax came up as potential RFS species. Now, they are known invasive species in the US. And so there was quite a bit of concern both from uh, the public uh, and, and interested organizations as well as from other federal agencies in terms of what sort of precedent this might, might set. Uh, at the end of the day, through a lot of sort of internal discussions, EPA did put out a number of, sort of risk management guidelines with regards to those species. But again, that's you know, something that, that we need to be attentive to. I already mentioned some issues with regards to biofouling. So for looking at um, you know, mobile offshore sort of energy platforms, that's something to think about. And even with sort of terrestrial and the, the picture up on the, the right-hand corner with those, those turbines, you can see just sort of the, the, the pathway that sort of cut through that mountaintop that could lead to the, the movement and spread of invasive plants um, you know, through that kind of infrastructure development. So again, needing to think through, you know, are there risks associated with the um, types of management measures and, and other activities that we're taking to address climate change issues um, and making sure that invasive species concerns are integrated into those. If we sort of move along the um, invasion curve to early detection and rapid response. This is an area where the, the council has been very active over the past several years, really trying to look at you know, what would a, a national early detection rapid response framework look like? What are the components um, that need to be put together, whether you know, at the federal level, at the state level, working with other partners? And clearly, this is one area that, that I think is where the, the intersection with climate change is particularly strong. Um, and thinking through sort of a number of, of elements with regards to EDR, obviously the horizon scanning, sort of being able to identify what are the particular species that, that you know, have the potential to be introduced into the US or into a particular region or, or state. And there's quite a bit of activity going on here. Uh, US Geological Survey, uh, has an organisms in trade assessment, so thinking about introductions into the US. The Fish and Wildlife Service has been working on a range of transportation pathways, so secondary spread within the US that are more specific, um, addresses more specific geographies. And there are also a number of other non-federal entities working in this area. I think Florida is putting together one of the first all taxa horizon scans, and there's a similar effort within the Gulf of Mexico. So I think 
one of the questions is how do we aggregate a lot of this information and are there lessons that we can learn from that, whether it's at a regional level or a national level? I think that's something important to consider moving forward. But then when we sort of have an idea of well, what are the, the, the species that we're concerned about, obviously doing the, the risk assessments, the risk screening, Fish and Wildlife Service and their ecological uh, risk screening system, one of the key uh, fundamental criteria is the climate match. Um, also, you see tools like in EDMAPS and their invasive species range um, expanders listing tool. And so these types of uh, decision support tools are becoming more accessible and, and easy to use for managers at all sorts of levels. And then, you know, continuing sort of on, on EDR, there's also uh, hotspot analyses. Fish and Wildlife Service is also doing this in terms of looking at well, what locations are most likely to, to, to receive, be on the receiving end of an invasive species. And how do we think about that in a climate related context? And finally, a lot of this information is, is designed fundamentally to inform the, the type of monitoring that goes on. The, the US Geological Survey is standing up a biosurveillance network, which includes both invasive species as well as, as wildlife disease. And I think, um, as I mentioned you know, earlier in terms of thinking about the broader dynamics with regards to, to climate change in terms of whether it's sea level rise, temperature, or even severe weather events, how do those inform the, the targeted monitoring that we need to be doing on the landscape? Then sort of you know, moving further along, on, along the curve, I'm really sort of combining the eradication, long-term control um, measures as you know, ultimately the key questions there get down to the efficacies of the controls that we have, whether it's sort of biological controls and how does that influence the, the behavior of and the interaction between the biocontrol agents as well as the, the whatever target species they're working on, the use of, of pesticides and herbicides and their efficacy, as well as other methods of control, whether it's mechanical, uh, certainly prescribed fire has been used for uh, controlling some invasive species, but if there are you know, drier vegetation on the landscape because of drought or uh, concerns with regards to smoke and human health and respiratory issues, that could influence um, the, the use of prescribed fire or other mechanisms for, for control. Uh, while those might be limiting factors in the, in the toolbox, I think we can also think about how do we expand the, the toolbox potentially. Here, some genetic technologies have, uh, CRISPR and others, gene drives have been uh, kind of a major focus within sort of the scientific community in terms of their potential, but also, you know, major attention more broadly within in the public in terms of well, what kind of, of risks do those present? Uh, do we know what the risks are? How, we, how can we manage them? Are those acceptable risks? So a lot of discussion there, but I think, you know, there, there certainly is potential. Um, if we look at the issue of avian malaria and Hawaiian forest birds where the, the refugia for those forest birds are increasingly shrinking as um, mosquitoes sort of are able to come to higher and higher elevations. There's you know, a critical you know, moment where in terms of the, the sustainability of those populations. Right now, Fish and Wildlife Service is looking at sort of a, a, a technologies using Bulbachia to uh, try to sort of manage the the avian malaria, but there are other tools out there, specifically many targeted on malaria in, in Africa and the work of um, target malaria and using other genetic tools. So again, something to, to look at and consider for the toolbox. Then there's also the issue of, of species kind of resistance and resilience and working uh, transgenic, transgenically with the, the American chestnut to increase its uh, ability to, risk, to resist the chestnut blight. Um, but if we're thinking about populating chestnuts across the landscape again, we want to do that in, in a way that's sensitive to the changing climatic factors on the landscape. And then finally, and this isn't in the invasion curve, but I think it, it's, it's particularly important, is thinking about sort of the you know, broader restoration and management goals. What is it that we are, are really managing for? And, and how do we define those management goals, both as resource management agencies, as well as with the, the broader publics. Um, and this brings in things like um, decision frameworks. Uh, recently within the climate community, there's been a lot of discussion of the resist, accept, and direct framework. Um, 
Park Service as well as U USGS have been very active in that in terms of really trying to, to help managers think through what responses, uh, a framework for responses that they have on the landscape. There's also questions with regards to neonatives. So those native species that might be uh, expanding their ranges or having some detrimental impacts. And here, um, you know, it's useful to note, and this is going back to the invasive species definition, is some, some folks are looking at that definition saying, OK, a native species is moving beyond its typical ecosystem, its typical range. And therefore, that's how we're going to look at it within the context of invasive species and the invasive species definition. I'm not saying that that's a federal policy, but that's one sort of angle to look at in terms of, well, how are we defining these ecosystems that we're, we're concerned about? And then finally, kind of on the flip side of that, you know, looking at assisted migration or, or managed relocation. So those native species that might be imperiled that, um, you know, there is a desire to see them sort of live on or continue in, in another sort of um, uh, analogous environment, but that, potentially presents invasive species risks. How do we measure and um, accommodate those? And so the, recently the Park Service has been developing their own ecological kind of risk assessment to be able to look at those, assist, those issues associated with um, assisted migration. So for the kind of second part uh, of what I wanted to, to go through today, I really wanted to focus on what is it that the Council has um, done over the past years with regards to climate change. And I, I think um, first, it's probably just useful um, to, to note that the council includes 12 different federal agencies, federal departments, as well as four White House offices. So that's looking across a broad range of authorities and interests. So dealing with not just public lands, but transportation, human health, um, international uh, assistance, as well as uh, policy issues, homeland security, uh, military and defense. And so obviously that, that range of issues and how they intersect with invasive species vary across the different departments, but also similarly, how those different departments are interfacing with climate change differs. And so you know, trying to sort of put that mix together makes things very interesting in terms of what sort of rises to the top in terms of overall concerns and priorities for the Council on Climate Change. But as I think about that, that question and what we've done in the past, I think, you know, to be honest, um, there, in terms of what has explicitly sort of focused on climate change, you know, in, in, in title by name has been fairly minimal. And, and, I, and whether it's a case of the emperor has no clothes, uh, I think it's, we, we do have to recognize that there's certainly more that we could be doing on this topic and certainly different um, administrations come in with different priorities and we respond to those. Um, but again, it, it's sort of um, something as we look forward that we need to be considering in terms of the role of the council. But if, but if we do look back, back to sort of 2010 and 2011 with the Invasive Species Advisory Committee, they put out first a general paper on invasive species and climate change, and then one more specifically focused on marine bioinvasions. And I was particularly happy to see that the first session um, for this symposium is focused on the marine issue. And I think, I think that that's great and certainly an area where we do need more attention. And then in 2014, working with the Aquatic Nuisance Species Task Force, we had a joint working group that tried to go into a lot of these issues in more depth. And many of the things that I'm talking about here with regards to, to, to pathways, early detection, rapid response, that paper went into some of the, the climate modeling and, and frameworks like the resistance and resilience frameworks that were being developed at the time. Again, a lot of good information, but that has subsequently been built on uh, by likes of the risk networks and, and experts. That said, um, there's also, there have been a, a number, I think, of important hooks or linkages where um, it, coming out of the administration that has really helped promote some of the work that we've done in other places. So in 2014, there was a, a White House Council on Climate Preparedness and, and Response. And one of the recommendations that they made was the development of a national early detection and rapid response program. And really that recommendation was what kind of set the trajectory for a lot of the work that the council has done over the past five or six years with regards to early detection and rapid response. Now, all that work has not been funneled through a climate lens, but as I hopefully you know, just talked about that there is a major intersect between 
climate change related issues, global change related issues, um, and early detection and rapid response. Also in the, the 2016 executive order, there's a specific provision in there for federal agencies to look at climate change and, and how it relates to invasive species with regards to their own particular mission. Um, something you know, that we can certainly build on. And then more recently with uh, the, the um, incoming Biden administration back in January of 21, one of the first executive orders or um, early executive orders from the administration was focused on climate change, both in terms of the domestic as well as sort of foreign related aspects. And there's some really key nuggets in there that we're now sort of seeing how are they gonna be sort of rolled out and implemented. The, the first of those is the, the Civilian Climate Corps, which is putting a, a workforce on the ground to be able to, to address some of these types of issues. Second is 30 by 30, and that is the aim to protect 30% of US uh, lands and waters by 2030. Uh, for the Department of Interior, that's being rolled out through the America the Beautiful campaign. But in that, in sort of protecting uh, and conserving those resources, how do we factor in the invasive species concerns. And then finally, another one just to pull out that I don't think has gotten as much uh, attention as it might, at least from the invasive species community, is the issue in, of environmental justice. Uh, certainly within the climate change uh, discussions, there's been a significant focus there, particularly on public health related issues. From an invasive species perspective, certainly the recent discussions around common names, uh, naming conventions, European gypsy moth to El Dispar and, and the like. Um, I think there's more that we probably should be looking at there and paying attention to as to whether there are kind of social, additional social concerns, particularly when you factor in the climate change related issue. A couple other sort of major hooks, the, the recent uh, bipartisan infrastructure law is devoting significant amounts of, um, uh, of of funding to Department of Interior, as well as the Forest Service for invasive species control. There's uh, language for the development of a invasive plant uh, control program within the Department of Transportation, which is designed to hopefully pass funds through to, to states for activities. And then significantly more money um, for areas like wildfire issues. And I'll talk about that in a bit. And then finally, what's still on the table, the, the Build Back Better bill, which has a significant climate change component. We'll see where that goes with regards to the discussions in Congress. But again, that could be a major touch point. So within this, um, and thinking about how does um, NISC interface with these issues, there, there are a number of sort of key cha challenges or questions that I see. You know, first and foremost, how do we integrate invasive species into these types of discussions? And within that, how do we translate that to really providing the uh, institutional support <clears throat> and, and leverages that can make programmatic change to help empower both the federal practitioners as well as our, our non-federal partners. And also you know, looking back um, to the work that, we, that we've been doing more recently, how do we um, sort of magnify that work or accentuate the work there uh, in, in a climate related perspective? And that's you know, what I got to sort of touch on right now. So first I mentioned uh, wild and fire a little bit ago. We've been working on this for about two or three years now. Obviously, sort of wildfire and um, natural fire cycles are an historic component of many ecosystems. And the idea isn't to get rid of, of wildfire on the landscape, but to understand, you know, the, the, the its normal um, context and the, and the role that it plays needs to play within the ecosystems. Now, invasive species and climate change are influencing the timing, the frequency, as well as the severity of those fires. And we're also seeing that wildfires themselves, as well as uh, responses to wildfires, has the potential to introduce or spread invasive species. So there's kind of both sides of, of the ticket, so to speak. And if we just look at, uh, for example, invasive annual grasses, um, they have the potential to change fuel properties on the landscape, potential to increase fire size, both through horizontal as well as vertical continuity across the landscape. Um, they can increase uh, fire intensity with larger fuel loads, as well as fire frequency, um, as often non-native species are able to you know, recover faster post-fire than, than the native species 
And finally, I think what we're seeing from an institutional perspective is a lot of times in terms of fuels management, there's more of a focus on timber related resources than there might be on invasive plants and vegetation on the landscape. If we add in sort of the, the climate um, issues to the mix, uh, you know, one of the things we're seeing, you know, with, with, with warmer winters might mean sort of less dieback of forest pests. Longer growing seasons may favor invasive plants on the landscape. Longer fire seasons, obviously, sort of greater impacts there. Increased drought might dry out vegetation on the landscape, increasing fire risk. Increased CO2 may favor uh, C3 photosynthesizing plants, many of which are invasive. And then there's finally sort of issues associated with, with rain shifts for both non-native species as well as native species. And while a lot of attention in this area is devoted to, um, in the media, particularly to, to the West, to California, really this is a, a national level issue. Um, but it, and again, you know, sort of harking back to what I was talking before about sort of the national level, you know, phenomena, but then sort of regional level specificities, you know, based on the species, uh, based on the particular biogeographies, we're having to look at this issue across different ecos within eco regions within the US and then figuring out, okay, how do we match that with national programs and policies for federal agencies. And as part of this effort, we're, we're working with the Wild and Fire Leadership Council, which is an analog to, to NISC in the Wild and Fire arena, um, really to identify goals and opportunities for collaboration across the two sectors, figure out how they can advance federal actions, and then how do we build collaboration with non-federal partners. And we've got an, an interagency group that's been, been working on this for uh, a while now. And that group has been um, focused on sort of prioritizing opportunities. And that's really looking at sort of six major themes. Three of those are the stages of engagement. So pre-fire planning, vegetation management and the like, the actual response to the wildfire itself, and then finally recovery and restoration efforts. And then there's also a, a number of cross credding focal areas like funding, information and data management, research and development. And I think particularly for those, those last three uh, cross-cutting areas, I think I've, I've identified some of the issues already with, with potential for, for funding, um, information data manage. How do we look at um, fire risk information with climatic information, with invasive species information, and match those all together in ways that can support decision makers, um, federal, non-federal agencies. And finally, um, with regards to some of the, the research questions, uh, under the, the leadership of USGS and with Forest Service and other um, academic practitioners, there's an interest in developing a state of the science review. And so again, that's looking at some of the, the national trends, but also digging deeper at the eco-regional level to understand what are the particular dynamics between invasive species and wild and fire there. And I think that could be a very useful contribution uh, to the community writ large. So moving on from, from wildfire, um, I did mention you know, quite a bit of work that, that federal agencies have been doing around rapid response and the work that, that NISC has been looking at with regards to a national EDR framework. I'm not gonna go too much into the work that we've been doing right now on federal agency roles and the criteria and considerations for a rapid response fund, other than to note that um, it's critically important that we are thinking about all the components for a national EDR framework because they could equally be focused on species that are in one way or another influenced by climate change or global, global change as not. And so um, I think that's just a, a um, safety net that, that all of us would prefer to have in place. One area um, that was on our uh, FY21 work plan where we, we didn't get as far as we would like for capacity reasons, and I'm, I'm hoping that we can sort of dig into it more this year, uh, is the area of disaster preparedness and response. So we're thinking about sort of, you know, what are the risks that are posed with regards to severe weather events in terms of introducing species, moving them around, um, and that's both the event itself as well as the, the, the post-event response. So first, you know, just getting an understanding of you know, what are the tools and information resources that are available. For example, the US Geological Survey has, and their national uh, or non-indigenous aquatic species database has what they call sort of a, a fast map tracker. Um, so flood and storm tracker. 
And basically what that does is after a major weather event, it will look and see, you know, based on stream gauges and other information, what watersheds have been interconnected. And then from there, given you know, their occurrence data, getting an understanding where might there have been a risk of movement of aquatic invasive species from one watershed to another. So that, that's valuable information in terms of, of post-event monitoring. Uh, similarly, the, the Forest Service does a lot with um, forest threat assessments as well as vulnerability assessments. Um, and even in the climate change realm, there's a lot of focus on vulnerability assessments. So how do we think about integrating invasive species concerns a little bit more into those types of processes? And this is where I think some of the work on horizon scanning, species risk assessment, hotspot analyses can also be very informative. And then sort of the second sort of potential area that we can sort of think about or, or look at with regards to disaster preparedness and response is uh, the types of guidance that would, would be useful. And, and here we're, we've got the interesting sort of uh, dynamic of you know, very localized information versus sort of broader generic information. On the, the page on the right-hand side, I, I put a fact sheet that was developed for FEMA for the brown tree snake. And that's really thinking you know, in the event of a cyclone in or around Guam, what are the types of considerations that responders may need to take to make sure that they are not um, sort of potentially moving or transporting brown tree snakes in their vehicles or their gear. So what, what type of information is useful for those responders who may be coming in and not aware of the particular invasive species threat to that region? And so there's going to be very sort of localized concerns for a particular species in a particular geography, given whatever severe events um, might be uh, likely within that area. But then thinking at a national level um, and, and, and FEMA within the Department of Homeland Security, they have guidance that's national level guidance um, under the, the national response framework. They also have a series of um, emergency support functions that address things like uh, agriculture, natural resource management, infrastructure, human health. Again, sort of written at a very general level to be applicable to sort of all states um, and, and all federal agencies. And so at that level, what is the type of guidance that might be useful um, to, to think about as, as we work with our, our various federal agencies? And then the, the final piece I wanted to, to mention with regards to some of the work that, that we've been um, focused on is in the area of information and data management. Um, and, and really, I think we need to sort of highlight uh, a lot of the, the data repositories both federal as well as non-federal that have increasingly been using sort of the occurrence data and the other data that they collect to help develop the decision support tools. So I think it's a critical function. Often it's, it's under-recognized, it's, it's undervalued, it's under-resourced. And so I think one of the things that we'd like to do is really sort of highlight the value of those types of programs. Again, recognizing that, that some of it is um, occurrence data, looking at um, you know, manage, recording management impacts on, on the landscape and the like. And then some of it is also qualitative data information like that contained in the National Invasive Species Information Center that's uh, under USDA's National Agricultural Library. And that's giving information to, to managers as well as to, to the broader public on this issue. Um, so I just wanted to um, close with, with a couple thoughts around some the, the issue of regional approaches. Um, earlier in the, in the presentation, I kind of noted that, you know, different regions have their, their different, um, I'm not going to say pet invasive species, but they're different priorities. So whether it's the lionfish in the Caribbean, forest pests in the Northeast, um, uh, dressanid mussels is a concern in the Pacific Northwest, carp in the Midwest, um, brown tree snake in the Pacific, you know, a lot of the, the, you know, the invasive species concerns are very regional by nature. Um, but just as uh, invasive species don't respect sort of sport uh, state borders or um, jurisdictions, similarly they don't respect our you know, the boundaries of our different regional institutions. And I think one of the things here we need to be sensitive to is that there are different regional organizational frameworks across um, the United States. And just sort of looking at uh, Department of Interior's internal regions, and they've been trying to harmonize them to some degree versus those in the forest service versus the aquatic nuisance species panels, um, the aquatic nuisance species task force regional panels. There's a lot of different sort of variations across these types of regional entities. And I think one of the things that we need to be sensitive to is 
how do we make sure that, that, that we are communicating, recognizing that they're going to be invasive species that cross those boundaries um, and being more inclusive in the conversation rather than less inclusive. And this is kind of the, the landscape that the, the regional uh, invasive species and, and climate change uh, networks are you know, going to be layered on top of as well. I think one of the, the key advantages with regards to um, risk is that it seems like often they're combining you know, federal agency personnel with folks from states with academia. And so I think it, that itself creates a nice um, ability to mix the different institutional actors that are relevant to those regions. And then kind of as a, a final sort of summary slide on this, um, you know, and this might be overly simplified, but kind of think, going back to some of the comparative advantages. So at the national level, thinking about national uh, sort of policies, resources, whether that's financial information, expertise, and programs. Then at the regional level, and Tony mentioned a lot of this in terms of the product of, of the Northeast risk, so that the commonalities biogeographically and otherwise that we're looking at synthesizing information, some of the coordination and communication aspects, and then at the site level, the focus on implementation, planning, and research. And obviously there's you know, sort of crossover between those and inter intercommunication between those, but it, it might help us, us think how to, again, how do we sort of build on the comparative advantages at each of these levels? And for my last slide, I just wanted to um, provide a, a brief um, advertisement. Uh, back in, in 2019, our Invasive Species Advisory Committee, the charter expired. Um, we've been working to sort of restore that in September of last year, there was an executive order that would reauthorize ISAC, along with a number of other federal advisory committees. Earlier this month, Secretary of the Interior Holland uh, signed the charter, so um, it, with those two steps, ISAC is you know, well on the way to being sort of reformed. And I'm hoping that in the coming weeks, we put out a federal register notice that's calling for nominees for net membership. Uh, and I think this might be, you know, one area where we can, um, you know, working with the, the risk networks um, and the various non-federal partners within those to, to focus on uh, invasive species and climate change. And what we're going to try to do is really to match up the NISP work plan with the agenda items uh, on ISAC and where ISAC can provide advice to the council. So I, I'm glad that we're going to be getting our, our advisory committee back up to speed. And again, I'd like to see how it can help out in, the, in this issue area. So with that, I'll, I'll close and I'm happy to, to, to take any questions either sort of now or my email address is up here and I'm always uh, interested in sort of talking these issues through further. So thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Sash. That was a great presentation. I really learned a lot. And um, we've got some questions that are starting to come in. So I will just take them in the order that they arrived. Um, Gary Fish would like to know if you have seen or responded to the many permaculturists and others that think invasion biology is racist. Okay. Uh, so I would say sort of the, the council as a whole has not sort of responded or had any um, I think formal response to the issues of terminology and, and terminology um, as well as uh, broader issues with, with invasion biology, that's not a new set of issues. More recently around the discussions just with regards to, to common names, we've been working from the, the NISC staff perspective in terms of just making sure that federal agencies are aware of the discussions that are going on, for example, within the Animological Society of America, um, I think also the Ornitho Ornithological Society and other places that are looking at some of the issues regarding name changes. Uh, at the end of the day, that's just you know one, I think, sort of small subset of the issues. I, you know, I think there will always probably be detractors um, in terms of invasion biology, um, in terms of you know, folks who, you know, um, are, are sort of pro plants or, or, or animals and don't like to see um, any sort of uh, control programs on the uh, on the landscape, and that's just you know a, a constituency that we need to, to continue to talk with and to work with, and recognizing that you know, our first choice isn't to be out there trying to you know, eradicate those species, but trying to do a better job in terms of how do we sort of prevent their introduction in the first place. Great, thank you so much. Okay, the next question. Um, is from Justin Dalaba. I'm curious what decision support tools might exist, if any, similar to the flood and storm tracker to monitor change 
and invasive species spread post fire, um, either prescribed or wild? Good, good question. I think that's that I don't have a an easy answer for that. Um, that's certainly something that we're going to be working with the, the task team on. I know that the Forest Service had has had a couple of different types of models that they've used in, in the past. Um, I'd have to sort of go back to my notes and sort of um, to, to identify the names of the specific programs. But if, if you want to get in touch with me offline, I'd be happy to sort of look into that. Great, thanks. And we have one more question in the chat box. I know it's 1.30, but I'll just go ahead with it so we can um, have covered them all. Uh, are there specific funding opportunities in the Build Back Better Act that would bring funding to address invasive species management on the ground? That's kind of an open question. And, and even with the, the infrastructure law, I have to say, you know, there were there kept being sort of changes up until the, the last minute. Um, and so, Certainly within the, the Build Back Better Act, there's a lot of focus on, on climate change, climate change resilience that, depending on how the, the wording is aligned, could be applied to invasive species. It's tough to say without any sort of details or a final bill or law what those would be. But I think it's certainly worth just going back and looking at, you know, what do we have with the, in the infrastructure law? And, and in there, there was I think $100 million, both for the Department of the Interior, as well as the Forest Service to be working on invasive species. Uh, right now, I believe both of those agencies are looking at what does that mean for their internal programs? Will any parts of that be sort of grants or pass-throughs pass -throughs for states or others? So, um, you know, I, I think just recognizing that there's $200 million there is a significant bump, you know, compared to past funding for invasive species. And we'll continue to, to look at and monitor the Build Back Better Act to see what kind of opportunities that might present. But again, that's kind of a moving picture, so it's hard to hard to say. Well, thank you so much, Stash. This was really a great talk, and we're so grateful for you taking the time to come share your federal perspective with us here at the RISC uh, Symposium.